So, uh, like was already said, everybody knows uh, Tim is a VC, but uh, he's uh, many other things as well. He's been uh, running a TV reality show, he's a songwriter, and he likes kind of quirky stuff and uh, out of the ordinary stuff. So, Estonia is one of those things. <laughs> Another thing is uh, educating the next, uh, next generation of entrepreneurs. So, uh, the floor is yours to take, uh, tell how you are doing, actually. around a little. Um, so this is great. It's a great honor. Um, there were a couple of things I thought were um, that, that I wanted to cover in our earlier panel. So now that I have the stage, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, one is uh, I've been traveling now back and forth, uh, Eastern, Western, Eastern, Western Europe. And, uh, and I noticed that, uh, that there, it's like anybody in Eastern Europe is sort of recovering from the Soviets. And my, um, and my student, my former student, Sander, said to me that the, the farther he gets away, the farther you get away from Soviet Russia, the more colorful it all becomes. And I think that's, that's the message. And the message is, um, when you have government control of a country, uh, the government decides everything, and so they end, end up deciding that we all live in cracker boxes and we all eat the same food and we all do whatever it is we do. But a great government frees its people to go ahead and color the world. And so, uh, so this is, I I'm loving what I'm seeing here in Estonia. It was fun. I was just in Romania, same kind of thing. Um, but two weeks ago, I was in Cuba. And in Cuba, um, they, they had an amazing country in 1958, and then, uh, and then it became government controlled. And, and something that's kind of interesting is uh, most of you are entrepreneurs or venture capitalists or whatever. Um, our jobs are all illegal in Cuba. You are not allowed to hire anyone. You are not allowed to distribute a product, and you're not allowed to make a profit. So imagine trying to uh, make a living while that happens. And when Russia's support left Cuba, uh, the place completely collapsed, and everybody started to starve, and the Castros kind of had to, you know, come up and go, okay, well, we're gonna let you kind of trade in your neighborhood, but you can't leave your neighborhood. Uh, or else you don't get fed. Um, and by doing that, he, um, he kind of admitted that, hey, it's a free market that makes everything work, uh, you know, even, even in Cuba. So, and that's in a place, people were starving in a place where the food drops from trees. Uh, so anyway, that was, uh, I wanted to cover that. I thought it would be kind of an interesting story for you. I, um, uh, the Prime Minister mentioned education, and so I thought I'd kind of go through my experience in starting a school. Um, I, uh, I bought an old hotel, and I told the city that I wanted to start a school. And this old hotel had been boarded up for eight years. And the city took me through just torture to try to turn an old beat-up hotel into a boarding school. Um, but eventually I got through that. And then I went to my lawyer and I said, now I need to start a school. And, and I said, what do I need to know? And he said, well, uh, to be accredited, uh, you, you need to do this and 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 this. And my eyes started to glaze over. And I started to think, I don't really need to start this school. And then I was at, um, it, but then I remembered his first line, which was to be accredited. And I remembered that I went to a high school that was not accredited, but it turns out it's the best high school in all of um, the United States. Probably about, you know, be slightly below average here in Estonia, but you know, it was good high school there. Um, and, and, uh, and I thought, well, wait, 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 what if I don't want to be accredited? And then he goes, oh, well, then you don't have to do any of these things. And so I've kind of made it my bucket list to go through all the accreditation things that I had to do. 
and do the opposite. So one of them was uh, you have to have a history department. And so all we do at Draper University is teach future. And then the other is you have to have three full-time tenured professors. And so uh, no one at Draper University speaks for more than an hour, including the prime minister, by the way. He, he kept it to under an hour. Um, and then, and then they, have, they said you have to have a grading system that individually grades each person. And I thought, okay, how am I gonna do this? Well, it, it turns out that when we get out of school, we're all in teams, and we live and die by those teams. And while we're in school, we're all focused on like, you know, getting the best grade we can for ourselves, but not necessarily for the people around us. And it turns out that in teams, uh, we work harder, learn faster, all of these th great things happen. So we, um, we set it up in teams, and I've had people come to me, students come to me and say, I never would have worked this hard if it hadn't been that I was gonna let down my team if I hadn't. Um, and so, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working my way down, and then through accreditation, uh, it's all for the safety and security of the students. A lot of the accreditation is basically they want you to put your students into boxes that are padded so that you ne they never get hurt. And so I decided to make the most dangerous school I possibly could. And fortunately, we've had, um, we've had eight students come through from Estonia to Draper University, and all eight have survived. So. But um, there's a reason for that, making it dangerous, is that um, one of the lines we have there at the school is, I will fail and fail again until I succeed. And what that really means is, uh, it's okay to make mistakes here. It's okay to screw up, do something wrong. And, um, and the reason I do that is that some of the greatest discoveries in the world were by mistake. Uh, penicillin was feeding moldy bread to people in hospitals. Uh, electricity was somebody going out flying a kite in the rain. Um, uh, Velcro was people were, who were just studying burrs, those things that stick to your socks when you go through the fields, uh, under a microscope. All of these things happen at Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. At least that's the, the ad is that they came together. Um, so all these things happen by mistake. So what we're trying to do is encourage more people to take more risks, to make more mistakes. And so what I say is our school's not for everybody, but it is for those people who have that little spark in their eye, willing to do whatever it takes to uh, create a, a great business. And, uh, and so then I decided, well, what would my school do? Well, the only thing I know is entrepreneurship because I've been a venture capitalist all my life. And so we decided that we would teach entrepreneurship, but instead of teaching by saying, this is what Steve Jobs did when he did this or whatever, um, we, uh, we instead just turn these people into entrepreneurs. And we do it by ripping their, uh, their hearts out, uh, taking away all what we call high school hang-ups. You know, in high school, you get all embarrassed by different things. We make those students get embarrassed almost every day, and we make them fail almost every day so that they come out just impervious to that kind of embarrassment. And, uh, and then they go through actually military survival training, and then there's urban and rural survival training. The urban survival training is You've got, tw <laughs> try this sometime. You've got 24 hours, go get a job offer on paper and come back. So 93% and 100% of all the Estonians have come back with a job offer on paper. Uh, and then real survival training out there in the woods, uh, we, we, we send them on these missions and they think that their day is done and then they get another mission, and then they think their day's done, they get another mission, and as an entrepreneur, you all know that, that that call from your biggest customer comes at the worst time, and 
you're, you're, you're thinking you've had a really big day and then all of a sudden the venture capitalist calls and says, if you can get in here at two o'clock in the morning, you know, we'll talk to you. Uh, and so, so those kinds of things you have to be ready for. And then at the end, we do this two minute presentation to a panel of venture capitalists. And then um, this worked so well now that we've had, uh, that's by the way, the biggest surprise for me. I think it's like Donald Trump has the biggest surprise is that he's still in the election. Um, but my biggest surprise is that my school is still up and running. Um, and we've run about 12 sessions, had 700 students. Um, so that's like more than 1% Estonian. Um, we, we've had, they've come from 70 different countries and they've started 250 different companies. And uh, some of those companies are really starting to, we don't have a unicorn yet, but we're getting there. And uh, that was so successful that we are now deciding that we're going to do a, a full year program. That's, that was like a two month program. We're gonna do a full year program that with, that's gonna be a master's uh, that just starts with that two months of what we call hero training. And then it moves on and they're gonna learn to code and they're gonna learn finance and they're gonna learn Robo marketing and some other things, but they're going to do it all team based and everything about it's going to be fun. So that um, that's what Draper University is uh, is all about. Now, um, this talk was supposed to be about supporting and inspiring the next generation of world changing entrepreneurs. I think I think it's important to uh, to encourage encourage uh, failure, encourage failure, but to also create a nice platform that they can fall on. Um, and, you know, all the social programs, I mean, I can only speak to the U.S., but all the social programs in the U.S. are, are sort of bankrupt. Social Security is bankrupt. The, the welfare program convinces people not to work because they get a better deal on welfare. Um, some of the prisoners are encouraged to go out and commit more crimes so that they can go back to prison and get a better deal. Um, I'm playing around with this, and I encourage you guys to think about this. I'm playing around with the idea of a basic income uh, where everybody gets sort of this basic income, any adult, and you get a certain amount of money, and you get it every two weeks, and everybody gets it. Billionaire, pauper, everybody gets it. And and then from there, you've got this platform that we're all on the same page, and anything you do from there becomes, uh, becomes gravy for the country. And I think there's something wonderful about that. You, you build your own career, but some of your taxes go to just paying everybody. Then think about this, when, when Bill Gates or, or uh, or uh, Nicholas or Giannis make all this money, there's no more schadenfreude. Instead, they're thinking, that's great. Those guys are gonna pay some taxes and they're gonna go into my basic income. And then you've got a culture, you've got this culture where you've just laid a very simple platform so nobody's gonna starve. And then you've got this amazing upside where you have a completely free market and, and you let everybody run. So I want all of you to sort of put that into your calculations as you go through your life. Uh, I think it'll be fun to, uh, to think about, encourage, uh, and uh, it might just be the future of government. Uh, you might actually see some extraordinary things happen there. Um, and I'm a believer in the free market. I think that that is the greatest thing and, and you can go throughout history and you can see how countries have done under, you know, I guess you call it socialist rule, top-down rule, control from the top versus allowing everyone to make their living. And, and the ones that allow everyone to make their living are, um, are where all the growth happens, all the success happens. Um, and, uh, and I had, until recently, I had three historic heroes. Um, and one was, uh, was uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, 
One was Gorbachev and one was George Washington. All three of them were leaders who pushed power away. And by pushing power away, all of the people thrived. And, uh, and I even remember my dad saying, I, I said to my dad, hey, I funded a, my thousandth startup, my thousandth entrepreneur. Hey, you know, good for me. And, and dad looks at me and he goes, that's nothing. Deng Xiaoping freed a billion entrepreneurs. So I kind of looked, oh, okay, I got a little ways to go. <laughs> and, and um, but those were my three until now. And now, it's your prime minister and your president because of what they're doing to transform government for the good of society. So with that, I leave you. Thank you very much for, uh, for this, and uh, thanks for being Estonia. Go Estonia. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, we actually have time for a couple of questions. Oh, good. Uh, so uh, we'll get uh, some of the audience, but um, I'll kick off actually with one. So you've seen many, many now Estonians, but also European entrepreneurs coming to the US and so on. When talking about training, educating and so on, what would be the kind of top three things you think that uh, Europeans and Estonians should train themselves on more? So what's lacking actually when they come there? You know what's interesting is, um, I'm, I think it's coming back here in Estonia, but um, when I was, I, I, I met with the, uh, the uh, president of uh, Slovakia about a week ago, and, and, uh, and I told him there are, there are three words you should just eliminate from the European vocabulary. Um, let's see if I can think of them all. Um, impossible, realistic, and humble. <laughs> so be bold, anything is possible, and what is realism? Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> One more. Actually, you're going to have two more questions. Okay, How two cool more is questions. that? We're going to take questions from the audience. So the first one up with your hand. Look there, Sven Illing. We even know everybody in the audience. The is so small. <laughs> so, uh, uh, hi. Um, so, could you, could you actually tell the story of uh, investing into Skype? <laughs> I will. Uh, I'll tell, I'll, there, there's sort of two stories because they're kind of fun. Um, the, the first one was I, um, I had backed two or three of these peer-to-peer -peer file sharing companies for music and they all got completely eliminated by um, the the music industry that came and sued 12-year-old girls for listening to music. And, um, but but what, what really was happening there was what happens to anyone who transforms an industry, um, the established players all line up against it. So when Bitcoin came, the banks all lined up against it. They, they complained to the government, they fought lawsuits, and they, they tried to get uh, bad articles written. Um, so the same thing happened in the music industry. We were a little cleverer with Skype. Um, uh, but then I said, I read something, and, I, and it, said, it said, these two guys are, are now selling off uh, Kazaa, and I said, well, they have that technology. There are a lot of good uses for that technology. Let's go, let's go hunt those guys down. And so Howard, and Howard Hartenbaum went and hunted them down and then uh, brought me, he said, you better come out here. And so I flew out and I met with Nicholas. And Nicholas, by the way, blew me away. Just amazing man, extraordinary man. And then when I met with Giannis, I thought, oh my gosh, this is unstoppable. And I backed them bef with, on another idea. Uh, it was going to be shared Wi-Fi, but then they called me just before they took my check and they said, hey, we've decided we're going to do something else. We're going to take on the phone companies. And I said, even better. That's great. <laughs> so then I got to tell you this other <laughs> quick story. Um, I, I, I went, um, I, I had to be in two places at once. I had to be at a board meeting here in Tallinn. At the same time, I had to be in Palo Alto. 
doing a pan, uh, doing a uh, speech like this, and so I I called up the guy who was doing the conference and I said, hey, is it okay if we do this by teleconference? And at that time, teleconferencing was like <laughs> this. Um, and he said, oh yeah, sure, I guess, whatever. And can you get that guy Nicholas to be on there with you? And I said, sure, that'd be great. So then I went and I talked to Nicholas and I said, hey, is there any tele video conferencing system here in, uh, in Tallinn? And at that time, it was all, Skype was all audio, three million users and all audio. And, uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, we got, we got teleconferencing equipment here. And I said, great, okay. So I get there and we sit down to do our little interview and Nicholas looks over my shoulder and he goes, okay, throw the switch. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. And I, he said, this is, we're gonna do the first Skype video conference. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> and, uh, and so we did it. And then I called my friend uh, in, in Palo Alto and I said, well, so how did it go? And he said, oh my God, it was so clear. We could see the pores of your skin. We heard every word. It was fantastic. And I turned to Nicholas and I said, we've got a winner here. <laughs> and he goes, not so fast, Tim. We cut off 100,000 simultaneous phone calls in order to get the bandwidth <laughs> to get the video, one video call. So uh, you entrepreneurs will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Uh, so do we have time for one more? Is that it? No, that's okay. it. <laughs> Two stories. Thank you very question. much. You. An amazing answer. Thank you.